glad to be invited here. I'm really happy to present our uh, recent work. And I heard that today might be the coldest day here. Uh, so thank you all for coming in to, to my talk. Um, so today I will be telling you about our work on uh, average reward residence benefit. Um, I'm really excited about this work because we were able to um, first break and then like remove a long-standing assumption that has been there since the problem was proposed. So I'm really excited, and this is a joint work with my PhD student Igor and uh, uh, colleagues Chang and Yudo at UW Medicine. Okay, uh, so let me get started. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to first uh, uh, give you an overview of what the problem is, what our results are, and then I'm going to use a random example to illustrate uh, how some existing algorithm could fail, and uh, uh, what our proposed policies are, and then like at the end, I will offer like a, a high-level view that's our kind of insight into this problem, okay? Um, so yeah, let me get started. Um, so many of you may have heard about the so-called stochastic multi-arbitrary bandit problem. Uh, so this problem, like uh, uh, as many of you may know, like you have multiple arms, and then like each one, if you pull it, it gives you a reward. You don't know the distributions. So you want to try out the different arms. You want to learn which arm gives you the most reward, and hopefully you pull that arm most of the time. Okay. So that is the uh, stochastic multi-arm bandit problem. I'm putting it there because I want to tell you like a restless bandit problem is a little bit different. So I don't want you to be confused. So restless bandit problem here, like each arm uh, is itself is a Markov decision process. So it has its own state, and uh, uh, you you have like this. The, you can pull the arm, which is one type of action. If you don't pull the arm, that's another type of action. And for those two actions, you have different state transition probabilities. And those parameters are all known to us, okay? And then, like, every time step, there's a budget. You, can, you cannot pull all the arms. You can only pull, like, some of the arms, or say, alpha fraction of the arms. And you want to decide, like, which, for, which arms to pull to maximize your reward, okay? So there's uh, no learning involved here. All the parameters are known. All the states are observable. So let me get into more detail uh, explanation of this problem. So like I said, each arm itself is an MPP. It has a state space that is known as finite. And uh, it has two actions, whether you use pull it, which is the active action, or it's the passive action, which is like you don't pull it. Okay? And it uh, has different prob transition probabilities under the two actions. And because it could also transit even if you don't pull it, it's called the restless bandit. Okay? And then like, for every state action pair, you have a reward, you collect a reward, and then you want to maximize the total reward here. Okay? So this alpha in here is our budget every time step. Uh, let's take this these three time settings, okay? Um, so our goal is to design a policy to maximize the uh, total reward, and uh, we are looking at the long-term average, so the average reward setting. There are other reward settings, but this one uh, is arguably harder, okay? And for example, to just uh, think about this problem, uh, you can think about like you are a manager, okay? Uh, like the department head, okay? And you're managing many projects here, and end projects. Um, so each project has its own state, okay? Maybe it's like uh, near the end or in the middle with your input, that kind of state. And, but every day you are pretty busy, so you can only meet with maybe uh, the people from some of the, uh, some of the project teams. You can only meet with half of them, and you want to decide which teams you want to meet with, okay? Maybe those who are waiting for input, or like uh, some of them may be like uh, already operating pretty well, so you don't need to meet with them, okay? And uh, uh, the constraint here, by the way, is an equality constraint. So every time step, you have to meet with all the end of them, okay? Whether they want to be meet with you or not. Can, we, think, can we think about the whole problem as a bigger MDT? Yes, I'm going to that, I'm going to that, okay? Yeah, this is the setting, and uh, uh, so, yeah, that's the MDT. This whole thing is a big MDP. We can write it out. We call this n armed MDP, okay? And uh, here, this is the expected reward every time step. And we are taking an average, first average over the arms, so this is the reward per arm, okay? Just to normalize it. 
and then like we are taking the time average here, and then this is the horrible thing. Okay. So, but this problem, if you to solve it directly, is hard to solve. It's proven to be hard to solve when, especially when n is large. Okay. Your state space is just n-dimensional. It's pretty big. Okay, so usually the question we want to ask here is kind of this refined or modified goal here. We want to efficiently compute a policy that is near optimal. And it's near optimal in the sense that, like if you look at, uh, this is the optimal reward per arm, okay? And this is the reward per arm you can get from policy pi. And you want the gap to be diminishing when you have more and more arms. Okay, so then your gap to the optim uh, optimal reward is diminishing. Okay, so this is different here is called optimality gap. We want that to disappear. Okay, so is the setting clear to everyone? Like, uh, if you have any questions, this is a good time. Do you assume that these rewards are non-negative? Uh, we don't need to re re assume that the reward can be anything. Yeah. But you also impose this equality constraint. Like uh, the, 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 this is equality constraint, like yeah, you have to pull uh, off uh, exactly off an arms, yes. Question. So how do I think of the policy pi? Is this a policy sequence pi sub n? Or uh, yeah. somehow okay. we can unify them into one policy? Um, so in general, a policy can look into the past, but you can prove that it doesn't have to be history dependent. No, no, no I meant like in terms of n. Oh, you know of n. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, you, you kind of you kind of think of uh, a class of policies parameterized by n. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But because it's efficiently computable, it's not going to be some like arbitrary pattern. Right, right. Like you, you need to be able to either write it out or like uh, mm -hmm. compute it in a very efficient way as n grows. Maybe related to Sherwin's question about the scaling with n, but presumably there's going to be some structure to the problem with n. And then, like, one thing I could do is I could take any problem with with k arms and then just add a bunch of obviously useless arms or something. Um, I guess because of the alpha n, the yeah, the alpha n first is a constraint; it's proportional to the number of arms. And here, like for simplicity, let's assume all the MDPs have the same parameters. I was about to say that, sorry, oh, it's homogeneous. Okay. So the okay. NDPs are sort of uh, identical. Right, right, right. There's a way, there, there's a way uh, to generalize this to heterogeneous arms, but like you said, you need to define how you scale the system then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, so this is the setting, this is our goal, and uh, uh, so this problem, sorry, maybe let me go back, okay, uh, here. Uh, it has like a, many applications like in resource allocation or like the maintenance kind of problems. But I basically I really like it because um, this is a large MDP on its own, but it has this structure that gives us like interesting like uh, ways to, to get policies. And uh, um, this in this large N regime over here that I'm studying, um, this was the original asymptotic regime in the in the paper uh, by Wito himself. Um, so Wigo was the person who proposed this problem, and uh, uh, he proposed this famous policy called the Wigo index policy, and that was conjectured to be asymptotically optimal in this sense. Uh, but this conjecture uh, was not uh, uh, proved in the original paper, but rather it's proved that in the later paper, the Wigo index policy, it has a diminishing optimality gap, but under some conditions. So first the condition is the so-called indexable condition, which basically means we call index needs need to be computable, okay? Uh, it needs to be well-defined. And then there's the other uh, 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 assumption here that's called, uh, uh, that's later referred to as uniform global attractor property. It's pretty technical, but generally speaking, it, ha it has something to do with uh, the so-called mean field limit of the system. And I will explain more like what this means, but uh, basically you need to assume a certain uh, ODE or difference equation to have, a, to have a uniform global attractor, okay? So under that uh, assumption, this is uh, asymptotically optimal. And then there's a later work that generalizes the Wigo index policy to a class of policies called LP priority policies. And uh, they are all uh, asymptotically optimal, but under a similar condition. That's also a UGAS condition. Okay, and then there are later papers that are very impressive. They show that the optimality gap is not only diminishing, but it's uh, uh, exponentially small, but then you also need like the UGA 
definition plus some non-degenerous kind of assumptions. And uh, uh, so previously, those are in the continuous time setting, and uh, you can you can do this for the discrete time setting too. Okay. So, but this kind of raises the question that like it, whether this U gap assumption uh, is really necessary for the problem is is the fundamental to the problem. And I will say one word about U gap. It is a kind of a really hard to verify assumption. If you are given a problem instance, it's hard to verify that U gap is satisfied. It's easier to verify that it is not satisfied. So basically, it has some easy to verify necessary conditions, but uh, not sufficient conditions. So this kind of limits like the use scenario of those policies because we don't know if the assumption is, is satisfied or not. Okay. So then we want to ask it if it's possible to achieve asymptotic, asymptotic automatic without assuming you get, okay? And uh, uh, maybe one caveat here, like I want to uh, point out, like we all, uh, like all the work, including the uh, our work, we assume this uh, kind of standard abiotic and mean chain assumption, okay? Okay, so this is a question we want to ask and uh, our answer, we, we kind of provide some answers to this question. So first uh, we, have this paper from uh, last year. Uh, this is a, we, we proposed a policy called FTVA. It achieves the optimality gap like this, and uh, we don't need U gap, but we need another assumption called, that we call synchronization assumption, okay? So this is another assumption, but we can show that there are problem instances that do not satisfy U gap, okay? Do not satisfy U gap, but satisfy our assumption as A. So this is the first time we were able to break the previous new gap assumption for asymptotic optimality, okay? And uh, of course, you can see that our optimality gap is not as good as something that like we have like, uh, figured out how to get the smaller optimality gap, okay? Uh, so uh, then, uh, then in a recent paper we just uh, wrote, uh, we uh, proposed another class of policies that we refer to as focus set policies. And now we really get rid of the U gap assumption. We don't need assumptions beyond the standard assumption, and we achieve still like one over square root of the automatic gap. Okay. And then like uh, for the continuous time case is actually simpler. Like uh, our previous like FTVA policy just works. It doesn't need U gap. Okay. Okay. So that's the overview of our results. Okay. So. Um, now I'm going to give you an example, and I will demonstrate the path of policies, okay? Uh, so, but before that, I want to mention one thing, okay, to help us think about the problem. So, we have this unarmed problem, this unarmed MVP. It's very related to a so-called single-armed MVP. So, this single-armed MVP is just like uh, the problem for one arm. So, if we think about the first arm here, okay, and then we can still try to maximize the average reward for just one arm. And our constraint here is kind of a relaxed version of the budget constraint. Previously, it's a hard constraint. Every time slot, you need to pull off an arms, okay? Uh, so then on average, each arm should be pulled off a fraction of time, okay? So that is this uh, 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 relaxed budget constraint here. So now for this arm, we like just this time fraction is alpha, okay? So this is a single armed MVP, and uh, um, it is not uh, hard to believe that if you solve this, then the optimal value here provides an upper bound on the end armed problem. Okay, be just because the budget is uh, relaxed, okay, you can you can prove this. Okay, so that's an upper bound, and uh, uh, moreover, this single armed MVP it can be solved uh, uh, efficiently. So here we think of the number of arms as being large, but each arm's state space is not quite large, it's a fixed size. So this single arm MVP can be solved, okay? And the solution here, um, like there's an optimal policy and there's an optimal distribution over the states uh, for this single arm MVP. And uh, uh, all the past policies, including our policies, are based on this solution, okay? Okay, but let's see like how can we turn this into a real solution to the unarmed problem. Okay, I'm going to first, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you what the example is and then I'll tell you what the, uh, the previous policy is. So in this example, this is the state space for arm, okay? The arm has eight states, okay, each arm, single arm, and uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And for this arm, 
um, basically our action would move the stick to the right or to the left, okay? But we only collect the reward if we're going from seven back to zero, okay? So we call this a, a slide because you would want to climb up, 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 up until you get to the top, and then you take the slide and you go back to zero, that's when you collect your reward, okay? That's the only case to collect the reward. Okay, so then let me tell you the transitions. So for the four states on the left, if you uh, pull them, if you play the active action, then they generally move to the right. That's the correct direction, okay? You want to move to the right, okay? So they prefer the active action, and we just call those their preferred action, but if you apply the passive action, they kind of uh, go backwards, which is what you don't want, okay? So that's those left arms. Uh, sorry, left the four states, okay? And for the states on the right, those four states, um, if you don't pull them, it's the opposite. If you don't pull them, they generally move to the right. And if you go from seven back to zero, that's when you collect your reward, okay? So the, their preferred action is the passive action. Okay, if you apply the active action, they kind of uh, go back, which is not good, okay? So just to quickly summarize, left the four states, they prefer active, right four states, they prefer passive action. And our budget is half. So for this problem, you can actually verify that if you solve the single arm, the policy, it's actually just to give each state its preferred action. Then you would end up with the, this Markov chain, which is very simple, the, the optimal state distribution is uniform, okay? Okay, I hope the, set up, the setting of the example is clear to everyone, okay? Okay, so now uh, let's talk about uh, 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 previous policies, okay? So this is our example. So in the past, the policies are all this kind of index or, policy or priority policies. What that means is, we, they would assign a pre priority order among the states. And then like, when they pull the arms, they start with the highest, the arm with the highest priority state. And then, like, then they will go to the next until they hit the budget. So for example, if zero were the highest priority state, you would first pull arm six, which is zero. And if one is the next one on the list, you, you look at arms in state one, you pull them. And now like you pull the four arms. If our budget is half, then you hit your budget, you will stop. So that's in general how those policies work. Okay, but the question, uh, so this is what I described, but the question is what priority order would make sense, right? This is a question for you, okay? So we want to assign, like for this example, we want to assign priority order to the states. What do you think would make sense? I want some answers from the audience, okay? Yeah, it doesn't have to be an exact uh, answer, but some general sense, okay. Uh, three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one, zero, that's the first of four, yeah. okay? Um, it's, and then the rest are, are like, uh, then the, the rest of four states are the lower half. <laughs> so this may be a little bit different from what you thought, but this is actually a trick question. Like, uh, there's no way you could figure out like the order between those four is this order because those are calculated from those numbers that uh, like were shown before, okay? But in general, okay, as long as you put zero, one, two, three uh, as like a higher priority than the states on the right, this belongs to this class of policies called LP priority. And this particular way of breaking the tie between one, two, three, zero, and the, the tie between seven, six, two, five, four. This is called L index. Okay, this is uh, calculated based on the two functions. But uh, yeah, that's that's the. Uh, but in general, you just need to know zero, one, two, three should have higher priority than four, five, six, seven, which makes sense, right? Okay, so this is the priority order, and uh, if we do this, let's see what happens. Okay. So this is a simulation of this uh, policy. The x-axis is the time slot, like time horizon, and the, the y-axis here, like I just, uh, um, uh, so those are the seven states, like each, each row is a state, okay? And uh, the color shows the distri state distribution of the arms, okay? So if it's a lighter color, that means there are more arms in that state. So then like, you can see that, we start from somewhere, as time goes down, so we kind of stuck 
like at the split, like, uh, at the distribution like this. And uh, if you remember our reward model, then this basically collects no reward because there's no arms in state seven. So you only collect reward if you are in seven and you go to like a state zero, okay? So, so this problem, like if you use this policy, you are stuck there, okay? And let's see like what happens. Uh, sorry, let's first compare it with our policy, okay? So for our policy, like we were able to just achieve a pretty uniform distribution, which is the optimal distribution, okay? But let's take a, uh, uh, this is the example where the previous you get assumption is not satisfied, but the upper SA assumption is satisfied, okay? So, but I wanted to show you a closer look at what happened to the LP index policy. So sorry, the LP index is a specific kind of index policy? Yes, yes. So there could be better index policies? Yeah, there could be, but the only policies that we know so far are like LP priorities, and uh, which includes uh, WIPO index. And uh, uh, they need this you get condition to be as uh, optimal. And, and your policy is not an index policy. Right, our policy is not an index policy. I'm going to show you what it is. Okay. Um, so uh, right now, let's look at uh, how LP index works. Okay. So we take the later half of the test plot and the plot them here. So I put some arrows here, which basically means where the state is being pushed. Okay. So let's look at this. Like our priority order is like this. Okay. So um, if you look at those states, we basically only have uh, uh, arms in states three, four, five, okay? We have no arms in other states. So then if we look at the priority order, we start with the three, and uh, uh, we want to pull three, right? And uh, so if we pull three, three generally goes up, okay? And then if we go down to the list, we go to five, and the five, like three, we only have uh, a small fraction of arms in state three. We haven't used up our budget, so we will have to pull arm five, but uh, our arms in state five. But state five doesn't want to be pulled. If you pull it, it will go down. Okay, and so then like the five will go down, three will go up, and things will be just trapped over here. Okay, so this is how like the states just uh, like the distribution just gets stuck here. So one thing I can mention is like why this could happen is that this LP index policy, remember, is designed based on the single arm, the MPP, and uh, that single arm, the priority order is determined by the optimal solution there. If your state distribution is far away from the optimal distribution, then there's no guarantee like how things will behave over there. So then, like, as this example shows, it could happen that. Uh, we will be trapped at uh, some optimal distribution, okay? So this is LP priority, and for our policy, even if we start from the same state, we were able to kind of just uh, uh, average out, like we were able to get out of this state, and we were able to make the state distribution uh, more and more uniform over time, okay? Okay, so... Comparing this, I, I'm not sure what the LP index policy is, but the bigger index policy, the, the bigger index itself was based on the Lagrange metric size, which is a bit pretty clear. Right, right. How is it different from the LP index? LP priority is more general. It includes Wittos index as a special case, but the LP, like, it, it kind of is more relaxed. It's like it, if you solve this uh, uh, LP that's, uh, that's like the single arm the problem, uh -huh. then you were able to uh, uh, divide uh, states into uh, positive, like the uh, states which, have, like you pull them is better, and there are negative states and neutral states, and uh, you just want the positive states to have higher priority than the negative states. And if you, uh, like uh, if the, uh, the so weak index will fall into, will be a special case of it. But weak index with the Lagrange metric class, they come well, looking at all the rest of the arms, like what is the best you can get from the rest of the arms. Um, so so the Lagrange multiplier is, is also based on the single arm, the uh, single arm, the MVP, and uh, that the Lagrange multiplier is for the cost, of, uh, the for the budget constraint. Okay. Oh yeah, budget constraint. Yeah, yeah okay. it's for the budget constraint. So, um, so this example, I forgot like what the weak index policy would be, but the, for some other examples, the LP uh, 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 LP index will be the same as the weak index, and we can also show that uh, sometimes they don't achieve asymptotic optimal. Hey, uh, 
Um, so yeah, this is just an intuitive way to demonstrate the difference. And now I can actually tell you what the other policies are. Okay, so we I'm actually going to tell you like two policies. The first one is this FTVA I mentioned. It's short for uh, follow the virtual advice. Okay, and then this is the policy that means this additional assumption called the synchronization assumption, but that doesn't need you yet. And uh, uh, then I'm going to tell, uh, tell you another policy, which is one uh, of uh, uh, one policy from our policy class that we don't need to assume additional assumption for. Okay, so let's start with uh, follow the virtual advice. Okay, so for this policy, we still start from the uh, the single armed MDP, and uh, let's assume the single armed MDP. The optimal policy is pi bar. Or sometimes I write pi bar star, sorry, they are the same thing, okay? This is the optimal single arm policy, okay? It just tells you whether you should pull this arm or not based on its state, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a virtual system that follows this system, this policy always for each arm, okay? And then like the, the virtual states will tell you some virtual actions and we will try to follow the virtual actions as much as possible. So let me demonstrate this. This is the real state, like we have four arms, they have, they have their real states. And now I'm going to simulate a virtual state for every arm, okay? And then from the virtual state, we apply our single arm policy pi bar, we get those virtual actions. So uh, the virtual actions could well be active, 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 passive. But if our budget is only half, okay, then when we try to decide the real actions, we cannot apply those because it exceeds our budget, but we will try to follow them as much as possible. So we'll just uh, take maybe uh, two out of the three actives and then turn the other one into passive. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. And the more concretely, let's look at the example. This T equals to zero virtual states, or like let's take the virtual states to be the same as the real states. Okay, we uh, uh, apply the policy, we get the actions, then we can see that uh, for for those green, the, the arms highlighted in green, their states and their actions uh, are both the same across the real ones and the virtual ones, okay? But because of our budget constraint, this arm here, uh, uh, so sorry, we call those good arms, but this arm here, uh, the virtual action and the real action are different, okay? So we call this a bad arm, okay? Now, like uh, when t goes to the next time step, things will transit, okay, uh, transition, and uh, we will couple uh, those uh, the uh, virtual and real systems for the good arms. So for next time slot, those good arms will definitely have exactly the same state again, okay. But for the bad arm, we cannot guarantee that they will have the same state. We actually let them transition independently. So their states could be different, like between the real and the virtual ones, okay? And uh, uh, but now, like, even in that case, we will still take the virtual actions from the virtual states, and we'll still try to let the real actions follow the virtual actions, even for the bad arm, okay? So in this case, like, uh, um, yeah, we follow the virtual action even when this is the bad arm, and our synchronization assumption basically assumes that their states will, the, the real and virtual state will couple in within the finite amount of time. That's our assumption. Okay, so the bad arm will turn good after some time. Okay. So, is the policy clear to everyone? What is the virtual state? The virtual state is just something we simulate on the <coughs> job. Like uh, we, we can, uh, it's uh, just something in our program. Okay, and the virtual state like the virtual state uh, evolves according to the optimal single arm the policy always. There's no uh, there's no uh, constraint. There's no budget constraint. It just follows that policy. Yeah. So the synchronization assumption is like an assumption on how your policy behaves, or it's an assumption on the MDP. I just want. To it's a, it's more like an assumption of the MDP. Okay. So uh, basically, to define this assumption, we can take out the single arm the MDP. We can define a leader follower system, and uh, that's just defined by the original parameters of the problem. And then, like we can say, okay, we need a certain property, like this uh, synchronization property, to be satisfied. And uh, I don't want to mention that, like, so basically, you just need to think about this basic 
two arm, more than one the real arm, one virtual arm system. And uh, it's easy to verify our synchronization assumption. Like it's easy to verify whether it is uh, uh, set, uh, satisfied or not. We can use kind of irreducible kind of uh, like uh, we like, like verify the re reachability of this to verify that. And uh, we also have uh, some intuitive uh, sufficient condition for it. Like uh, if every state has a self loop under both actions, then it's definitely satisfied. So does it imply, imply that you want to make sure that your approximation to the virtual state is not going to reduce errors for a long time? Yes, know, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it will come back eventually. Yeah, there's a, a question over there. So is it, just to be clear, is it better on one that like decouples possibly stochastically from your virtual? Yeah, as long as either the, the real state and the virtual states are different, or like when their actions are different, then this arm just goes back. So yeah. there's no distinction between? Whether it's because of the state or because of the action. Yeah, there's no need to distinguish between that. Yeah. So when you when you run out of budget, or you have, you have too much budget, I guess, how do you break ties? We just uniformly break ties. It doesn't really matter. Even between bad and good arms? Yes. We don't need to care whether it's good or bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And to recouple, we need the states to be the same, the virtual and the real one, and the actions that we take the same? Yes, yes, yeah. Only the both the states and actions are the same, that's only what we can couple up. Okay. And uh, we can prove that this has this one over square root of n automatically get. And uh, the proof here is actually pretty short, but uh, although I'm not going to go into it, but it's based on this thing called the uh, uh, Little's Law, which is very familiar to people who work in queuing theory, okay? So uh, it's very cute, like if you want to, I can explain it during the reception. Okay, so, uh, but I'm not going to describe it right now, and, but rather I wanted to just uh, uh, like show you this example again. Um, so like we said, LP index, it gets stuck over there because there's no guarantee when the state distribution is far away from the optimal distribution. But for, for our policy at TBA, the actions are basically determined by the virtual states. And the virtual systems always follow the optimal policy. So the virtual states will definitely be in the, like, they will definitely be uh, following the optimal distribution. So then, like, there's a, although even the real states this, the, the, it has a distribution like this, the virtual states won't be distributed like that. Even like by chance it hits something like this, it will become good again, okay? And uh, then that's, that's why like we, because our actions are basically uh, guided by the virtual states, so we won't be trapped like by a bad uh, real state distribution, okay? Um, I will come back to this explanation later, okay? So now let me show you our other policy, okay? So I'm going to take this, uh, what we call ID policy, uh, uh, which is simpler to explain. A quick recap of FTBA. I know you just saw this like one minute ago, but let me quickly recap it. Like for FTBA, you need to simulate virtual uh, states and then take uh, virtual actions from virtual states. Okay, but a more natural idea here is actually, what if we don't have, we don't simulate the virtual states? What if we just uh, sample actions from the real state? Okay. We can just decide, like, we can just look at our real state, we apply the policy, the, sing, the optimal single arm, the policy pi bar, we get the action that we call virtual action, okay? But we know that, like, from our intuitive explanation, if we directly do this, this won't work. Like, the real state, it could be in the bad distribution, and then that could throw off the, uh, the, the actions, okay? So, but this was our original idea. We kind of wanted this to work, but then we couldn't make it work, so we came up with the, the virtual state thing. Um, but after that, we came back to this idea, and we finally made it work. And now like, it, it actually works better than follow the virtual actions, uh, follow the virtual device. Okay, so the way we make it, uh, the, how we made it work is like the, the following, okay? So again, we have our single arm policy, but now each arm samples virtual actions from the real state, okay? And uh, now when we decide on the real states, okay, we do not arbitrarily break the type, okay, but we, but, uh, we will prioritize 
arms with smaller IVs. We give them fixed IVs like one, two, three, four, okay? And then we prioritize smaller IVs. So for example, in this case, if it's active, 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 passive, okay, then we want to satisfy like the arms with the lower IVs. We want to satisfy the first two arms. We make them active, and then like we go to the rest. Okay, so this is the fixed, fixed way of prioritizing the arms. So here's another example. So in this example, okay, we have passive, passive, active, passive. The problem with this is like we have too many passives, okay? Um, so uh, the bucket, you can think of it another way. Like uh, we need to pull half of the arms, which means we need to not pull half of the arms. Okay, so then we should satisfy the lower IDs first. We take their passive action and the turn, like for this arm, it happens that it also follows the virtual action, but we basically guarantee the lower arms, uh, uh, that the lower arms follow their virtual actions. Okay. So is that why arm seven was not a priority in your initial example? Um, the initial example seven is a state. Is that what you're thinking? Well, then was eight. N was eight, yes, yeah. and uh, uh, seven, uh, so, sorry. Arm seven, as I recall, I was gonna ask why arm seven was in state one. Oh, maybe I forgot the example oh, earlier. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah. I was, I was gonna ask why, why is that arm seven? Um, maybe we'll come back okay, to that. Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so here we sample <coughs> virtual actions from real states, but we have a way to prioritizing the arms. Yeah, question. So this seems like a one way to ensure that the arms that are like good remain good, and like you're gonna, if they're already bad, that is the one that you're gonna use to like, like satisfy your constraints. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, so yeah, that is a good intuition. I will explain an intuition like a, that's similar to what you just said. Um, so we have this uh, uh, theorem which guarantees that, okay, now we don't need additional assumptions, we just need uh, this, like, uh, uh, by the way, this uh, periodic unit changing it for the single arm then, maybe, okay? Um, so that's the, the same kind of assumptions that all the people are kind of assuming. And uh, then we have this, like, uh, uh, one over square root of n, automatic f, okay? And uh, the proof here is much more complicated um, it's no longer like a, just a, a short one based on Layton's law. Uh, I'm not going into this, but I'm going to explain the intuition behind this, okay? And it's pretty related to what you said. Okay, so intuition here. So um, first, okay, so this is the, like we have eight arms, okay? And uh, we have a budget that's half, okay? Half of them. And uh, we have a key observation here. So if we look at the first half of the arms, okay? If we run our ID policy, um, do they always follow their virtual actions? Yes. Yes. yes right. Like it, because we have like, we have enough budget to spend there, so they will always follow their their virtual actions. Okay, their ideal actions. And if they follow their ideal actions, that means that their arm state distribution will also convert to the optimal distribution. This is guaranteed by the unit chain. Yeah. Uh, if you are like Okay, and then we call this subset of our good subset, first half of arms, okay? Okay, so now, um, then like, let's look at the budget consumption by them. Although we have, like, we, we can afford to spend all the budget, but they won't be using all the budget, okay? So on average, each arm is using half, like, uh, because of alpha is half, okay? So then, like, on average, it actually uses half times half the n, which is uh, one quarter of n, okay? And uh, let's just take this intuition, let's say they, consume exactly one quarter of n like budget, okay? And then let's move on to the next uh, uh, one fourth fraction of the arms, okay? So then like, because we use the one quarter of n, so the budget left over is one quarter of n, okay? So now like if they really have this budget, then they can like always follow their ideal actions, right? So then like if they follow their ideal actions, then the good subset could expand to include them, okay? And then now we have a larger good subset, and we can actually keep doing this until like uh, we can we can expand the good subset to be like that range, like up to n minus big O of square root of n. Okay, the square root of n actually comes from the randomness, like uh, the budget consumption is not exactly equal to the mean, but it concentrates around the mean. Okay. Question. Yeah. 
right, so, so, but like if alpha is different than one half, isn't it like the mean of alpha and one minus alpha? Yeah, 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 right. Different. So if alpha is smaller than half, we can just do the, like this, uh, like we will be able to, if alpha is larger than one half, we can actually like just flip the rule of zero, one, and one, and it doesn't really matter which one is zero, which one is one. Okay, so it doesn't matter, like, Okay, it's yes, called the one z like the action one vector action is zero and uh, like it's uh, just a reverse thing. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, yeah, so this is uh, this is uh, our uh, this is uh, our intuition and uh, you may have some problem with the way we prioritize arms because we are prioritizing arms based on their IDs. Okay, that seems a little bit artificial, right? So we actually could like a, 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 we could uh, generalize this policy to a class of policies where the priority uh, priority is not based on the ID, but rather we have a more dynamic way of defining our good subset and how we extend the good subset. Okay, okay. So I'm going to skip that. I'm going to come to the last part. I won't even know how many minutes I have left. Uh, you're at four twelve right now. So a little over fifteen. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, so the last part is like a, an intuitive explanation. Like I'm going to kind of somewhat repeat what I said, but uh, in a more intuitive, but uh, tech, uh, more technical in the same time way. Okay, so let's look at this. So all the past analysis for, uh, uh, for residence studies is based on this new field analysis, okay? New field analysis is a, uh, a, a very useful tool for understanding large stochastic systems. And uh, uh, this, the, this new field assumption, like we'll see that it's not just unique to residence studies, but this kind of assumption is also need to, uh, is needed to assume for other problems, or like it, it can be proven so for some of uh, the other problems, okay? So let's first see what the uh, mean field analysis is. I'm going to just give you a very intuitive way to think about the mean field analysis. So to start with, we kind of need to represent the state in a different way, okay? The vanilla representation is like a, uh, what state each arm is in, right? But now we need to change up the view a little bit. We want to look at the empirical distribution of the states here. So what we needed to record is the fraction of arms in each state, okay? So for example, if we look at state zero, one out of eight arms are in, uh, is in state zero. If we look at state one, uh, then three out of eight arms are in state one, and so on. So we record all those fractions, okay? So um, this is uh, like a, a way to represent the state, okay? Okay, so then like uh, once we have this state representation, let's uh, work out uh, the mean field uh, approximation for ELF index policy. Okay, so this is the priority order we have seen, so uh, we, we saw in previous slides. And uh, uh, how are we going to do the approximation? We can think about this in the following way. So first, uh, we want to construct a so-called single arm uh, Markov chain, okay? How are we going to do that? We first uh, take over x of d, okay? This is, uh, those are the numbers correspond that correspond to this example, okay? And now let's look at the highest priority state, state one, okay? My Markov chain has eight states because this is just the state space. And uh, we look at state one, okay? And if we look at state one, there are three over eight arms that are in state one, okay? And uh, we should pull them first. Our budget is half, so we are able to pull all the arms in state one, right? So then like the transition, so the state one will be activated with uh, probability one, and those transition probabilities are just the transition probabilities under action one, okay? So this is the, uh, uh, how you trans transition from state one. And now let's look at the next uh, priority state, which is state two, okay? And uh, there are one fourth of the arms that are in state two, but we already pulled the arms in state one, which uses like three over eight, okay? So then we can only pull one over eight arms like from uh, state two. That means like we can only pull half of the arms that are in state two, okay? So then that means state two is activated with probability half and indexed with probability half, okay? 
So um, it, like the calculation here doesn't matter that much. I just want to give you a sense of like how we construct this mark of change. So then like, we take uh, the, act, this is the transition probability according to the active action, time it by half, the, the transition probability according to uh, the passive action, which takes probably a half, and uh, also have this self loop there, okay? So we can keep doing this until we construct the full mark of chain, um, but the basically this mark of chain uh, will have a transition probability matrix that depends on x of t, okay? This is the key thing, it depends on x of t, okay? So now here so comes a weird part of the mean field analysis. Okay, so now we actually, if we look at this mark of chain, we think of x t as the state probability distribution at time t for this mark of chain. Okay, if it were the state distribution, um, then we uh, just by the dynamics of the mark of chain, we know that x t plus one will be x t times the transition kernel in this case, which is like p, but it's a function of x of t, okay? So this is the difference equation, that's the mean field approximation for L to index. And if we look at this, uh, uh, this difference equation, we can verify that if x of t uh, follows the optimal distribution from the single arm of the MPP, then this transition kernel is the same as the transition kernel under the optimal single arm the policy, okay? Which basically means X star is the equilibrium of this difference equation, okay? So that's the good thing. Uh, it's a difference equation, it's the equilibrium is what we wanted. However, the thing is, like it may have other equilibrium, right? It can have other equilibria, and then like even when the p, p pi bar star is a, a periodic limit chain, but now we have this nonlinear dynamics over there. And uh, the x of t could well converge to other equilibria. Okay, so that is the issue. And uh, how uh, you get or like uh, other uh, past work overcame this problem is they just assume that x star is the unique equilibrium of this difference equation, and they assume x of t will converge to it in a very small way. Okay, so like I said, like I mentioned, in some other large stochastic systems. This is also like either assumed or proved under some policies, right? Like, uh, uh, but you, you need something like this, okay? So, but uh, when we look at the problem, we just think, okay, uh, p pi bar star is a really good transition kernel. Uh, it's a transition kernel of uh, a periodic unit chain, right? If we can kind of just fix that to be the transition kernel, rather than letting p depend on x of t, then that would be good, okay? So if we show this picture, basically x of t will be put into p, and then p uh, like uh, uh, kind of affect x of t through this dynamics. If we can kind of break this chip, this arrow there, and uh, somehow like put stick in at the p of x star, then then that's good. Okay, that would be a linear system. So we want we if we can achieve this, we say we break this influence cycle over there. Okay, and. Uh, uh, so that's like how I view our results. Like for our first policy, follow the virtual actions, uh, 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 virtual advice, okay? Uh, just like I mentioned, the way we break this is by looking at the virtual states. And the virtual states always follow x star, the optimal distribution. So then like if the transition kernels depend on the virtual states, rather than the real states is roughly, is, can be approximated by p of x star, okay? And then uh, for our ID policy, okay, every arm is affected only by arms with the IDs lower than it, okay? And uh, like we said, the, the intuition of uh, uh, guaranteeing, like for example, like the first half of the arms, they are always behaving in a, in, a, uh, in a good way, right? And then if we look at the next arm, it only gets affected by those good subset. And uh, uh, if it's only affected by arms in the good subset, then the distribution will be like this, and uh, the good subset can always follow their virtual actions, so their distribution also converges to x star, okay? So this is a really high level view of uh, uh, our insight. It's not a precise, okay? But uh, I feel like this, this kind of explains why the policies behave pretty well, okay? So yeah, so I'm going to just end here. 
So uh, quick summary, we looked at this residence benefits problem and we designed policies to achieve uh, uh, asymptotic optimality uh, without needing the u assumption. And uh, um, we des designed this, uh, our algorithm kind of avoid having uh, the, the nonlinear dynamics uh, as seen in the new dynamics. And uh, there are many questions here. So for example, we achieve the one over square root of optimality gap. Actually, um, can we get to exponential optimality gap without this new gap condition? Uh, that would be really impressive because that gap is really small. And that's not just a small theory. We simulate different policies. If the conditions are met, it, it, it converges really quickly. Okay, and what if the arms are heterogeneous? And what if, like, uh, um, right now we assume all the MTPs have known parameters. What if we don't know the parameters? Then this becomes a uh, reinforced <laughs> learning problem. And uh, um, I'm also interested, this is like a really open ended. I was wondering if anyone has seen any large MDP problem, but it has this, like, it, it consists of multiple components, and the interaction among the components uh, is weak. So then, like, in some sense, it has this structure similar to rest is and this. Uh, and um, I would be happy to uh, think about problems like that. Okay, with that, I'll just uh, stop here and uh, take more questions if uh, you have any. Thank you. So you mentioned an alternative to the ID policy where you like dynamically have this set. Is that sort of like a type of argument where you're like renaming, re-indexing the IDs or something? Like as long as it behaves well, you can kind of change its ID? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, uh, it's, it, it, it definitely has that kind of feeling. It's not exactly that um, because um, the way we expand it, we actually kind of look at, a quant we kind of quantify how much we can expand uh, based on the states in uh, you know, more dynamic way. Okay, so then uh, it doesn't only depend on the, uh, the indices, yeah. the, the IDs, sorry. Yeah. Um, maybe a related question, but like your goal with the ID policy is to like uh, not unnecessarily destroy a good arm into yes. a bad arm, right? So right. if you just break ties, each time you do the FTVA, but break ties by ensuring that the you, thing, like, yeah. you always, yeah, we were, th we thought about that, but the, we didn't figure it out, like how to kind of fix this uh, set of arms that like we want to guarantee to be good. Like, uh, so um, if we want to generalize it, then like uh, we kind of go back to this like uh, generalized version of ID policy, like we look at the states in uh, in, in, uh, within that subset, and we quantify how far away it is from the ideal uh, distribution. And uh, uh, if it's very close, then we can enlarge this set to be into more arms. So um, we kind of even end up with that version, or like the FTVA version. We didn't find something that can modify uh, our original FTVA to achieve the same effect. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, I'm completely ignorant here, but I was just wondering what happens in your model are by predictive constants. Right? Yes, yes. So what happens if you have a really restricted model where R is depending on R, at least could be almost good there. Yeah, that would be, still, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So if alpha is not fixed as a constant, um, then I think there, like, first, if alpha is diminishing, for example, um, then if you just uh, want the automatic gap to diminish, that's yes. just trivial because anyway, alpha only affects like a, uh, a diminishing fraction of things. Okay, so uh, so then, like, but I mean, uh, we can do it in a more refined way. It's not just the gap between this and the optimal policy is diminishing, but rather like you need to quantify how fast it diminishes in a meaningful way. Uh, yeah, otherwise, like if you can only go one arm, then Basically, one arm doesn't affect the average over all the arms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you need alpha, like a constant, uh, uh, constant fraction is this case where, like, you, if you just say, okay, the gap diminishes, it's meaningful. Uh, but if alpha depends on n, then we need other way to define asymptotic optimality. Right. The rate obviously needs to be 
like much smaller, smaller compared yeah. to the other. Right. Yeah. So what's the relationship? Right, right, right. Yeah, but I think that's a really interesting uh, question. Like uh, especially if we can couple that with the. Um, so there's another version of the problem which might be related to this, which is like the heterogeneous case. If you just divide the arms into a finite number of classes, it's not very different from the original one if each class occupies a fraction of the arms. But if some class occupies a diminishing fraction, then like, I feel like that's a meaningful regime, uh, but then like, you need to think about the opportunity gap also in a more refined way. I think this is related to the budget to the scaling question. So is there a way to like, like solve a single arm problem, but for a different alpha? Like for a different, different alpha. Like a different, like say the larger alpha or smaller alpha. You mean still a constant? Still a constant. Oh, and so then it use it for the, like, ah, is I there see. any benefit to that? Um, that sounds, an it sounds like an interesting idea. I haven't thought about that. Like, it, you, mean you don't need to solve it for every alpha, but to somehow use, make use of the solution of a different alpha. Yeah, and that way maybe you can maximize this good, good arm, right? And that's the set of good arms at any point. Uh, why is it related to the set of good arms? Sorry. Like right now, like, uh, like for the same alpha when you solve it, I think uh, there might be a lot more arms that are asked to be pulled, but you can only pull half of it, so some of the arms will become bad. Right? Uh -huh. if you but the single arm, the problem is it has alpha as its average constraint. So although like uh, if you look at the virtual axis, it could exceed alpha n, uh, but uh, uh, like it shouldn't exceed alpha n by too much. Like uh, because like it already the alpha fraction constraint is already built into the single arm MVP. I don't know if like yeah yeah maybe that helps a lot. I kind of relate your question to so, you go ahead. But okay, so I, I think they just said you have to pull exactly alpha n arms, right? So yeah. it's, it's like if alpha you if you make alpha bigger, then you, you may run into other issues, you're under Yeah. Yeah. You're but maybe, yeah, but maybe you're thinking of changing the constraint to be smaller than or equal to alpha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that that like that would make the problem a little bit simpler, but uh, uh uh, like it doesn't, it doesn't make the prop. Like it's just a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But maybe there. But maybe that there. Okay, like maybe that's the yeah. problem. I mean, then like that's really intuitively, good. like if you are out, if you solve, like I mean, suppose each arm has high ID with alpha probabilities asked to be pulled, mm -hmm. then yeah. the number would be close to like alpha, alpha, alpha n plus mm -hmm. square root. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so mm -hmm. on average, your virtual arms there are like slightly more are being asked to pull. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you can only pull alpha. Right, right. So, but if you reduce the alpha, you can try to match those two equal, and then maybe then your number of. You mean the virtual system doesn't use the same alpha as the alpha in the original yeah. problem? But yeah. maybe, like, for example, it could be alpha plus uh, one over square root of Something n kind like of that, thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Maybe there will be a better, like a really sweet point there. Yeah. Uh, like, do you have to? Yeah, so the problem here with the yoga is that you need some way to break the cycle in order to not get stuck into this pattern. Yeah. What happens if you just randomly don't follow whatever the best policy is? Whatever the, the, the uh, LP index tells you? Yeah, would that be sufficient or what do you that think? Is sufficient? I'm not sure, but that's an interesting thought. Like uh, other ways to kind of not uh, get stuck in a local optimal, right? Yeah. Like it, maybe if you run it uh, for some time, like just uh, let it like run in a random fashion to get out of there. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, could it be like a version of the heterogeneous problem where like the different arms have a different, I don't want to call it cost because it's like an exact budget type constraint, but like basically, some of the heterogeneous types, when you pull that arm, it counts as like a different Yeah, yeah, arm. you could in general generalize the mm -hmm. budget into a cost constraint. Yes. Yeah. And then you, you could still have like exact quality, but like the different types have different. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, equality will be a little bit hard to break through sometimes. Like yeah, but if you get rid of the like the number theoretic issue, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then, so sorry, what is the question? Yeah, could be, the, is, the, is that a simple, because you said heterogeneous should be a simple extension. If you change like the the intensity of each arm in some sense, um, and how it contributes toward the output. Right, right. Um, I, but when I said it's, it's easy, like uh, if you still have the regional kind of budget, that is easy. If we do this thing, I think we, we can also solve it. Uh, um, yeah, I believe if you change the budget into an inequality, then it would mm -hmm. be too yeah. hard to solve. Yeah. yeah. So what happens if we have finite number of arms? You don't have the concentration that you need, mm -hmm. but uh, like in say in a record minimization literature, right? Mm -hmm. There you work with finite number of arms. Right. But then you're still able to get a good sublinear regress right? in, in time. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so um, if you fix, so the, the, so this is the infinite horizon yeah. problem. So even in the infinite horizon problem, mm -hmm. you have finite number of arms. So right. I can still have a symptotic figure. Right, and you want to compare it to the optimal policy, and then you want yeah. to say like at time t, what is your difference like between your policy and that? So the average, average you got over time, too. Uh -huh. so I can do the average predicted over time. So, so I can do here again the average mm -hmm. losses over time. But it's finite number of arms. Is there any hope to? Um, so in general, like it's hard to solve that problem exactly. But I don't know. Like if you think about regret minimization, what would be the answer? I, I'm not sure. So in regret minimization, the, 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 they work with finite number of arms all the time. Yeah, right, right. But there, the regret comes from the fact that they don't know the parameters. But here, yeah. the parameters are known. So uh, okay. it's more like a computational. So you, you, you still know the parameters of the, the MVP, mm -hmm. you don't know the, the, the current state. Right? So oh, you don't know the current state. So, so here in, in your case, you, you, know. you know the current state. Right. So you don't, you don't know the evolution of the current state. But uh, because there's a randomness in how the state will evolve. Uh, sorry, like you never said when we know the parameters. No, no, you don't know how the state will evolve right in time because that's the randomness. In the yeah, we only know like the distribution of yeah. the evolution, right? That's right. Yeah, and uh, you were saying so in, in the regret case, there are two ways to look at. In a stationary setting, you you do not know the parameters of the problem. Okay. Right? So there, still can be thought of as a belief of the problem, belief of the R uh, itself, okay. belief about the state of the R, okay. or belief about the parameters of the R. So the original, say, say, given state, right? the belief itself was the state. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that can be done here? Finite state, finite number of arms? Or? Um, yeah. I haven't really thought about it deeply. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, like, in general, I think if the states are not fully observable, that's an interesting like, direction. Okay, in the interest of time, I would request that we take the rest of the questions offline. We still have a 30-minute consumption time here, but let's thank the speakers.